Today's show is brought to you by Percival Designs. Do you need a new website or logo for your small business? Head over to www.percivaldesigns.com. That's www.percivaldesigns.com to schedule your free design consultation today. Percival Designs specializes in graphics and brandings for small businesses and entrepreneurs, so you can continue to focus on what's important, your customers. Again, that's www.percivaldesigns.com, and it's 100% free for a design consultation. It's time to put your branding first. What's good, folks? Film critic and film festival director Kevin Sampson coming to you live on the Kim Trails podcast. So when you say what is a film festival, to me, a film festival is a celebration of film. Now, depending on the festival, there's different niche festivals, like I said, DC Black Film Festival. So you know that you're going to go in and you're going to see films that are by and or about Black people or people of African descent, I should say. But then you have like the DC Asian Pacific Film Festival or there's the LA it's Latino Film Festival. So you can have your niche festivals. Then you got like Sundance, which is one of the big meccas. But I think people should experience film festivals in their city because what you get most of the time are just stories that you would never see on the big screen or stories that filmmakers have really, I want to say, put their heart and soul into. And I know it sounds really, really cliche, but dude, like on the film festival circuit, you just get, you can tell that like, yo, this artist was passionate about what they did and they really wanted to I'm your host, Mo Chris, along with Trader Dre and AP. Good. Good, good. What's good? And we got a guest host today along with us. Y'all know him before in our previous episode, and that's uh, actor Omar J. Lewis. Say something to the family. Hey, hey, hey. What's up, Ken Trails family? Nice to be back on again. Blessings with my brothers. Thanks for having me on again, brothers. Always. Oh, yes. And we we had to get Omar on here today because we had to bring him as a a special uh, host because today, as a guest, we have Kevin Sampson. He's a filmmaker, also film critic and producer, and he's just come here and he's going to bless our episode today. We're going to talk about film and we're going to get right into everything. So and so before we get into the hard, tough questions and stuff, we're just going to relax. And uh, do y'all have anything on your mind? What's AP or Trader Joe? Y'all got anything on your mind? Anything that happened lately that you want to get off your chest or anything before we get started? No, man, I'm ready to jump right on in this thing. Oh, you ready to jump on in? Man, on? the only thing I probably uh-huh. uh, the only thing I probably got is I was looking on social media. And uh, remember that Nate Parker and that whoever he fought? That, oh, uh, Jake Logan? Logan. Oh. Logan Shouldn't have never been yeah, in the Yeah, Jake ring. Logan, well, yeah, your boy uh, Floyd Mayweather just called him out and they're going to fight in February. Oh, that's all money right there, man. That's just money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah money I, 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 I don't like that. I think that's going to diminish boxing, really. I don't want to see Mayweather fighting Jake Paul, especially in a match like that. I just think it's bad for the sport. Me I personally. I don't know, the man. Tyson Roll Jones was good for the sport, I think. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like seeing them old legends back in the ring. That was that was pretty good. Yeah. Well, know, Tyson still got it. it Should have been Tyson that won the fight, but you know, they had to keep it a draw. <laughs> yeah, they had to keep it a draw. And then also seeming the fact that that Nate they're going back to the Nate Robinson and Jake Paul fight, those guys fought for only six hundred dollars. And I, I thought I was reading it wrong, but I was like, I couldn't believe that. 
it was that low. I mean, you know, reality show stars get paid more than that <laughs> for episodes, you know, so I, I just, I don't know. We, we'll see how that play out. Well, anyway, so we're going to go right into the takeoff. And, and for the takeoff, like I said, we got our special guest, Kevin Sampson, on today. And I'm going to let him get a chance to introduce himself and tell the audience who he is. And we'll go on from there. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, tell them who you are. Hey, what's up, guys? Well, first off, thanks for having me on the podcast. I'm really excited to be here with you. As you said, my name is Kevin Sampson. I am a film critic. Uh, I like to say filmmaker, critic, mm -hmm. publicist, festival director, because I wear a lot of hats within film. I founded the DC Black Film Festival. We're going on year five next year. Oh, wow. And uh, I'm a part of the Critics' Choice Association, which, you know, we vote on the Critics' Choice Awards each year. I actually teach at Northern Virginia Community College, teach film appreciation. So film is just like something that I love. I've loved it for a long time. And, you know, besides breaking down film, I really enjoy finding fresh talent on the indie level, just in terms of doesn't matter who you are, as long as you're, you know, a filmmaker trying to tell your story, but then also black filmmakers that are telling stories that are by and or about us. And that's what DC Black Film Festival is all about. So cool. thanks for having me. Cool. That's awesome, man. Awesome, man. And and like you said, you've been running the, the Black Film Festival for five years now? Yeah, so it's going to be year five is next year. So I'm excited about that. They, a lot of times, as you guys know, like with entrepreneurship and all that stuff, people say when if you run a business for five years, then... Yeah, you know, that's a big success. So, yeah, next year will be year five. COVID definitely, and we could probably get into this, but COVID definitely has changed so many industries, film industry, but then also film festivals. And so uh, I'm also on the board of the Film Festival Alliance. And um, it's just, it was amazing to see this year how many of us, like, pivoted to virtual. And uh, so we could definitely talk about that, but... Uh, but yeah, man, <laughs> COVID is a beast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, myself being an actor, it kind of hit me too. I was actually getting my stride of like getting callbacks for a whole lot of commercials and then boom, COVID just slowed everything down, brother. So I understand, my man. Yeah. <laughs> and not only that, I mean, for you as an actor, now that they have the different restrictions in terms of getting on set, like, mm -hmm. I, and, and this is when that host and me, like, start switching, like, me asking you a question, but, like, that's crazy in itself, right? Like, just in yeah. terms mm -hmm. of how you, you got to jump through so many different hoops just to get on set and then, yeah. like, perform, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's already hard getting on set in the first place. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And now it's all these restrictions, so, yeah, but... <laughs> I don't know how they want to do it. I guess that's why they got me as a uh, guest host. But you did talk about film festival and being an entrepreneur. So as a black artist myself, and I have been looking towards of making my own films. We got our own studio in Houston and our own equipment and stuff. How did you go about learning the film festival market? and starting up your own film festival in the D.C. area. How did you go about with that, sir? Yeah, so I went to, I went to grad school and, and got my MFA in film at American University in Washington, D.C. I graduated in 2011, 20, 2012. I started working at Arlington Independent Media, which is a public access station. And so there, like, we would teach people that came in, like, TV studio, filmmaking, audio production, like, all, you know, all that stuff. But at the public access station, they were running the Rosebud Film Festival. And uh, with the Rosebud Film Festival, it was, like, the only festival that I knew of that was, like, giving out $1,000 to the top five filmmakers. It was, for a while, it was strictly DMV. For those that aren't familiar with the DMV, that's D.C., Maryland, Virginia, not uh, where you get your license. <laughs> and, and, and so because I came on and like at the time when I graduated, I just started PictureLockShow.com, which is like my own website as a film critic. And I was 
man, in the beginning, I was like hustling, like hungry. I, I'd go to advancedscreenings.com and try to find out when there was an advanced screening. I had to wait in line for like an hour, hour and a half to, just to kind of get in because it was always first come, first serve. And and then I would get in, I would write my review, I'd put it up, and like for a while that was just the grind. And then soon I got into the DC, uh, Washington DC area Film Critics Association because I had everything. And, and so that switch was was really key because then I could just like, you know, kind of show up and I could go in and all that kind of stuff. So back to Arlington Independent Media, they knew that I really loved film. I was, you know, graduated from grad school. And so they were like, you want to start running this festival? And so I was like, of course, like I had always wanted to start my own. So I started running it, learned the ins and the outs of how to do it. And then I, I guess it was like 2017, uh, my wife and I, we moved down to Charlotte. And at the time I was like, well, I might as well just go ahead. And I've always wanted to step out on my own anyway. So I started DC Black Film Festival and that's how that came came about. But with the DC Black Film Festival, my like, so in 2012, the Gina Davis Foundation did this study, and the study was on um, girls and archery. So in 2012, Brave and The Hunger Games came out, and the key similarity between those two films is that it the main protagonist was a female and then had a bow and arrow, right? They were archers, and so that next year girls in archery like shot through the roof right and when they mm -hmm. when they interviewed these girls it was like 75 percent of them said that they did it because they had seen those movies the prior year and so to me it's very important that we see ourselves on the big screen yeah. mm. if we don't see if you can't see it then a lot of times it's crazy but you don't think you can be it and yeah. so what had what, what actually what wound up happening in terms of starting the another part of starting the DC Black Film Festival was I went to see Think Like a Man too, and as a critic, I came out and I was hot because Think Like a Man one I really I really enjoyed it I didn't think yeah. I was going to, but they mm -hmm. were playing for each other's heart and that was the stakes and that was important right and we saw Black yeah. Love on the big screen, and two, yeah. it became the Kevin Hart show and Kevin Hart is yeah. funny and all that good stuff but like who can throw the best bachelor bachelorette party to me was like yo we only get so many big screen uh, blockbusters with black you know predominantly black casts so i wrote this open letter of black screenwriters and in doing that i got a lot of feedback and so as a filmmaker i was like all right i'm gonna go shoot this documentary and i entitled it the hollywood blackout I started What's it called? The, the uh, fundraiser thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I forgot the name of it, but um, I started one of those Kickstarters. That's what it is. Oh, uh, so yeah, so yeah, because yeah. they left a, it left a, it left a sour taste in my mouth. Because uh, I was like, yeah, thirty thousand dollars. I'll be able to fly around. I'll be able to do this. I'll be able to do it right. And I didn't. I didn't make it. So it was egg on my face. But because I had heard back from so many black artists. And they were like, yo, we, we're out here, we're writing these stories, we're telling these stories, we just don't have access to the money or the places to exhibit. I was like, all right, so start my own film festival and, and provide that opportunity. And it's been really dope ever okay. since, man. Um, some of the filmmakers that have come through to go on to do bigger things, and not that we did it, but like just to be like, Transition. yeah, <laughs> Morgan Morgan Cooper, who's doing the uh, Fresh Prince, you know, that uh, whole remake, like yeah. he came through in the first year with, it was a dope short film. So it's like, no doubt that it makes sense that he's gone on to do that. But I'm talking too much. I'm going to open oh. it back. <laughs> oh, man, we get to listen it, and that's how it just be going sometimes, man. Do you mind uh -huh, if I jump ahead. in, Mo Chris? Because I'm, oh, yeah, I'm yeah, fascinated, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. man. I'm fascinated. So... You, you mentioned going through Kickstarter to try to raise the funds, and you said you didn't make it. I know that those kind of setbacks are kind of a common thing when, when people are starting a business, venturing out into entrepreneurship. What was your experience like as far as when you first came up with the idea for the film festival? How did you get it funded? How did you get it promoted? How did you find the, the resources you needed to market this, to let let everybody know hey this is here for you yeah that's like a great question so <laughs> the funny thing is 
and and it's honestly to to be straight transparent, it's still kind of been hard to find funds to do it. We've been in the black every year, which is great. But I remember that first year, I was just like, man, I'm gonna put this on my credit card if I have to. Like, I just mm-hmm. want to make it happen. And and that first year was all about like show and prove, right? Because while I had run a different film festival, like it was this is the first actual film festival in Washington, DC. There there was a DC black film and theater festival, but there wasn't like a film festival. And so nobody knew who I was, right? (laughs) And so it was, like I said, show and prove. So it was just one of those things where, like, I was just going to do it, even if I had to put it on my own credit card. And luckily, I definitely have connections within uh, the industry within D.C., but I just knew a lot of filmmakers. I had the prior experience with the other film festival, and so I just put it out there. And like I said, like... Our people are hungry for a place to exhibit their work. And the thing about DC Black Film Festival is it's inclusive, right? So the only stipulation is that one or more of the above the line crew, cast or crew, has to be of African descent, right? So what does that mean? Above the line is your director, producer, screenwriter, key actors. And so only one person has to be of African descent. So that should be easy, right? <laughs> like <laughs> your director is black, right? Your producer is black. And so what, what, what's been cool is sometimes like some years, like one year I actually had to email a production because I was like, you know, who, who is black here? Because it was like a Middle Eastern cast and, you know, directors, all that kind of stuff. And they were like, oh, our producer. And so by doing that, it's still inclusivity, but it's guaranteeing that someone that makes decisions on your crew is of African descent. And so that has been really awesome. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. I know I went into a little bit more. (laughs) No, that's cool. That's cool. (laughs) Yeah, I got a question, man. Uh, Kevin, I know we spoke earlier about Nate Parker and uh, kind of get blackballed or whatever. But I guess my question for you is you talked about how it's important to see, you know, us on the screen, on the big screen. So I guess my question is probably more personal, but are you willing to kind of take that step? Like uh, if that means, uh, I mean, are you willing to take that step if that meant that you would get blackballed, you know, to get something out there to that would benefit, you know, our people as a whole? Versus, you know, trying to just, you just kind of maneuver through the, through the, you know, the scenes and kind of just stay kind of low key, you know, like not try to ruffle no feathers or anything. Yeah, that's a great question. I think integrity is everything, right? Right. And so the biggest question is, you know, how do you go to sleep at night? So right. if, if I, if I feel like when I go to sleep, I don't feel good about something that I've done or I can't stand in front of my kids and they be proud of me, then that's a problem. So to answer your question, I think that one, I think ever since I was younger, I've always kind of been more of a politician. And so in terms of being strategic and smart about things, like I would definitely do that. But if it's time to take a stand, then it's time to take a stand. And for the most part, I think there's this habit of people being on the wrong side of history. And when you're doing the right thing and you're standing up for the people in the right way, like history will prove that you knew what you're talking about. You knew what you were right. doing, right? Even if uh, your your name is marred for a time. So did you consider yourself one of the gatekeepers in indie film or is there such a thing? I think there's definitely such a thing. So the funny thing about it, right? So as a film critic and and a publicist and a festival director, I see a lot of different angles of the industry, right? And so as a critic, like each year, like right now, like my emails are crazy in terms of publicists 
hit me up. Hey, have you seen our film? Have you done this? Have you done this? Done this? So the film industry definitely had, it's like a, I don't want to call it a game, but just like you would call it a rap game or whatever, like there's right. the film game. And, and so when you can hook into the right critic body, right? Mm. You build buzz for your film. When these, when these film critics go to Sundance or they're going to Tribeca or Cannes and all that kind of stuff, like those films that get brought up and get buzz get pushed to the front. So for instance, last year, one of the films that I, I like, I saw, um, I went to Sundance last year, and the film that I thought was going to get the most buzz and attention was Loose, L U C E. And I've been saying this ever since last year. <laughs> this was a film uh, with Octavia Spencer and Kelvin Harrison Jr. And I, when you, I talk about a masterclass, oh, masterclass in acting. So yes, there's I love Octavia one, Spencer. Yeah, there's this one scene between Octavia Spencer and Kelvin Harrison Jr. It's just electric, full of subtext, everything. Anyways, the story is about this boy that's adopted from war-torn uh, Eritrea. I think that's how you say the country. Um, but he's adopted by white parents. He was a child soldier. They put him through a lot of counseling. And now, for lack of a better term, he's like the Obama of his high school. But the film really analyzes the boxes that we put people into, right? So as the high school, like, he can get away with certain things. But, like, his friend who's on his basketball team, like, gets caught with weed or something. It's, like, a totally different outcome. And so the whole film is just, like, kind of analyzing that. This film should have gotten a lot more buzz than it did. But as a member of the Critics' Choice Association, I... Th- Man, don't quote me on it, but I think it's like 4% of us are African-American. So if I go to see that film, I'm like, yo, this is the joint. But then some of my colleagues go see that film. It's not going to hit them the same same way it hits me, right? Right. Instead, other films hit them in, in such a way because film is subjective, right? So life experience, how you relate to it. And so it, it becomes very difficult for certain films to get pushed to the front, right? Unless you have like a get out where so many film critics did not go see it until the buzz came and people just kept talking about it and they were like, oh, we got to see it. And then even on their podcast, they were like, oh, I'm so glad we went and finally caught it and blah, 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 blah. I say all that to say in terms of gatekeeping, I think in all industries, there are gatekeepers. There are people that are afraid to allow fresh talent to come in. But in film in particular, it almost becomes gatekeepers by proxy because of the fact that the way the game is played, mm, there's just a lot of talent out here that doesn't get pushed to the front. And that's why with the film festival and even the book that I wrote, I'm trying to give indie filmmakers that answer and like how to get up to the front. Man, man, this is awesome, man. This is so far, man. And we got to take a break right quick, and we're going to continue back with the uh, cruising altitude. So, Kevin... Seeming that you are a film critic, right? Here on Kim Trails, on our platform, in real short, can you give us your your critiques on the Jordan Peele HBO series Lovecraft Country? Man, Lovecraft Country is Get Out meets Indiana Jones meets The Twilight Zone. <laughs> <laughs> like it's just this it's it's hard to really kind of put into words but I personally loved it I felt like the writers did such a great job of putting that show together of leading us along for 
you know that entire season and I, I definitely I highly recommend it like I said like man it's got the Indiana Jones moments it's got the sci-fi you know and it's just hard it's hard to believe that all of that was put into a, a show that is predominantly you know african-american cast uh, but they did it and i really enjoyed it and even even like the gladiator like episode seven seeing those female warriors oh my god that's my favorite episode i, I couldn't pick one if i had to pick a favorite it'll be episode seven i mean it was just amazing they they did a, such a great job man they yeah. let that bussy stuff out though man <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about the, the 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 stuff that like randomly would just blah, but it had yeah, nothing to do yeah, with the character building? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't you know understand. That. It yeah. didn't have anything to build. Like it didn't build the character. Right. Like, it it did help the story. That's, that's, that, was, that's that HBO contract. You know, you gotta you gotta put something like that in to get on HBO, bro. <laughs> that's the, that was the agenda. It, it had absolutely like, and then it, it's like it, they they hit you with it, and then like, what's what was the point of that? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, didn't build, it didn't build the story. It didn't build on that character. We already know what's up with that character. So why why why? I digress. <laughs> <laughs> man, appreciate that, Kevin. Man. All right, guys, we're back for the cruising altitude, and uh, we're just going to keep things going, man. And we're here with Kevin, and uh, he's laying it down, giving us a lot of gems on the the insides of the uh, film industry and everything. So, and uh, and uh, like I said, we're just going to keep going. Now, I want to come from a, a history point of view with this next question, and I, I I've been learning about the black exploitation era, and so since since you being more knowledge knowledgeable in film than I am, can you ex- expand upon the notion that the black exploitation era saved Hollywood? And if you agree or not, I was just wondering you let our audience know your opinion about that. Yeah, definitely. Y'all want the the history long story, or you want a short version? <laughs> I'm down for both because I need to learn because I don't. I need to learn. I, I'm trying to understand where he's coming from with this perspective. I had never heard of. Him. Okay, all right. Save in Hollywood. So, like I told you guys, he's film appreciation, and when everything got started, D.W. Griffith, uh, Birth of a Nation. <laughs> Speaking of Nate Parker, right? But D.W. Griffith's film, The Birth of a Nation. It was the first, like, huge feature film blockbuster, right? And so you always have to give respect to that film because it laid the groundwork for every shot size, uh, way of shooting, movement within camera, um, uh, cutting, editing, everything. And this is the first Birth of a Nation movie. One with the uh, around the turn of the century with the KKK and all that, right? Yeah. All right, I just had to let that in for the listeners. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So D.W. Griffith makes this film in 1915. Now here, here's the deal. It's it's kind of interesting because one of the things I always talk to students about is D.W. Griffith shot like 200 what they called one reelers, but he shot like 200 films before he got to this one. And the big thing is that because he had so much experience and he put in the hours when Birth of a Nation came on the scene, like this was kind of unheard of, right? And people loved it. But the problem is it's a double-sided dagger, right? Well, cinematically, it laid the foundation for so much. It also laid the foundation for so many stereotypes that still are entrenched within our media to this day. So here you have the introduction of what later in, in terms of film history we call, you know, the mammy, the buck, the coon. Mm. But um, 
so so that's where we see all these different stereotypes, right? And then we get Oscar Michelle, who then does Within Our Gates, and he's like the first black film filmmaker. Now, what's the difference between D.W. Griffith and Oscar Michelle? Well, Oscar Michelle is like modern day ter- Tyler Perry, but back then he shot his films, he made his films, and he would have to take his real city to city, right? So slowly you're able to see these prints and we're able to see ourselves on the big screen, right? But for D.W. Griffith, he had money behind him. So those prints went out quickly. Now, film is is just kind of really kind of taking off at that time. So what you see presented before you, like this is what you think about Black people, right? <laughs> I, I bring that history portion in to say that you move forward, 1969, Gordon Park, The Learning Tree. This is the first time, 1969 now, when a studio backs a Black director uh, in a film. So Warner Brothers backs Gordon Parks. There's a lot riding on his shoulders for this to be successful. The film is successful. Definitely suggest folks check it out if you if you haven't because you, I mean the film is book ended. It starts with a an unarmed black man getting shot in the back by a cop. It ends with an unarmed black man being shot in the back by a cop. <laughs> so talk about like just it being timely and it being timeless. Anyway, the point, the reason I bring up Gordon S. Parks is because because of the success and because this is the first time that a studio backs uh, an African-American directed a black film uh, or a film directed by a black man, it opens up the, the doors for others to do the same. But that was in 1969. Then I think it was in 71 that Gordon Parks introduces us to Shaft. So he directs that film. And Shaft is the first time that we see ourselves kind of as this, you know, hero. He's cool. He dresses well. You know, we got the, the funky soul music. That's and right. exactly. It does well. And so to your point, now studios are like, whoa. All this money, we didn't know that we were supposed to be marketing towards black people. Uh, yeah, like let's do more of that. And so, excuse me, that's when the black exploitation era really kind of took off. And Melvin Van Peebles also had Sweet Sweet back in '71. And so the combination of both of those films and the success, and Melvin Van Peebles with his, his was like self-funded. Bill Cosby actually gave him a fifty thousand dollar loan. And I think the film went on to make like 11 million. So, so of course, <laughs> the money talks and then mm-hmm. the studios get behind it and they just keep trying to make all these films where black people would go and see it. But that's how you get that black exploitation era. And like anything, you know, if you if you see Shaft, like, you know, OK, this is it was kind of more serious on a serious tone. And then as the black exploitation era goes on, like it's it becomes sillier and sillier. Right. So hopefully that kind of answers your question. I could just keep going, but... <laughs> no, no, I understand because, you know, Hollywood and the studios at the time, civil rights movement, people weren't going to the theaters and, and things like that. Matter of fact, a lot of these mainstream theaters were showing, like, porno flicks. And they was also showing these uh, Chinese flicks, you know, when you had the Bruce Lee and all that came in. And so when they start filling these seats with black movies boom, that money started coming back on again. And as we know, as history would tell us, they took that money, the major studios like Universal or whatever, and made your first blockbuster film, which is Jaws. And then, anyway. <laughs> oh, um, I did have another question about film festivals and people starting off the indie film. How do you make money in the indie market? Simple question. If I'm a director <laughs> myself and I'm making my own film, my own creator, how would I go about? And I'm not talking about millions of dollars or anything like that, but a way to see some profitable income. Let's say if I have a ten thousand dollar budget and making it, making my money back, I should say. All right, so plug time. I, I I've written a book <laughs> on it. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. uh, so so Army of One PR and marketing for the indie filmmaker is kind of blurred out, but definitely 
caught that. So basically what I do in this book is I break down just from pre-production to post-production, like how you should be thinking as you, as from a idea to um, exhibition and distribution. So basically I think the thing that's really incredible about today's filmmaker, right. Is that we have social media. So you're really able to like put yourself out there. And the biggest thing that I would say is your filmmaking process as an indie filmmaker, it should be a journey that you document, right? So as soon as you come out with the idea and you know you're going to do it, then putting it out there in, in the public and just saying, yo, I'm about to make whatever. Let's just make a, a funny, a silly title. The Fox oh, and the Ham. Kim, yeah, yeah, Fox and Ham. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was about yeah. to say Kim oh, Trails. <laughs> right, Kim, let, let's, let's go with that. Kim Trails the movie. So, so automatically you're like, yo, everybody, yo, Kim Trails the movie is coming soon. We're about to get into production, right? And so that does two things. One, that makes you, you, you don't want to be a liar, right? <laughs> so it puts you on the hook. People are going to start asking you about it. But then you can start to document that journey. All right, so you're taking photos, you and the fellas getting together, right? We're taking a screenshot of the podcast, like, hey, we're all getting up, talking about, you know, the movie, blah, blah, blah. Now the script is done. Boom, you put that out there. And the whole time, like, you're taking pictures, you're you're documenting the journey, and what you're doing is you're building a tribe, right? Mm -hmm. So your friends know about it, you know, Chris's friends know about it, Dre's, AP's, O's. So all of your collective circles know that this is happening. Then once you actually go into production, same thing, like you're shooting, you're taking behind the scenes stills. And the other thing is like making sure you have your social media on point. So, you know, we got Kim Trail at Kim Trails, the movie on everything, Facebook's, Instagram, everything. Like a whole new catalog of content. Yeah, exactly. Mm. And so you're just putting out like, hey, this is what we did today, you know, and, and not just like the shiny stuff, but like. Mm. Yo, today was difficult. We didn't know yeah. how we were gonna be able to provide craft services for the crew. You know what I mean? Like, but we made it work. Cut these subway sandwiches up, you know. <laughs> and at the same time, you're tagging Subway. Cut these subway. You know what yeah. I mean? And so it's one of those things where you also want to try to get strategic partnerships. So along the way, you know, whatever, you're tagging other other folks, but if Kim Trails the movie is about spreading knowledge and information, right? That's what the podcast is all about. Mm -hmm. So then once everything is, then you start looking at, all right, what schools can we strategically partner with to show this film? You know, uh, different maybe educators in the community, things like that. So again, I think the way to make money off of it is to, show the journey, but build your tribe so that once you actually have a product and you're putting it out there, people are, are, are looking forward to seeing it and people are, are able to get behind it. Because if you don't have that, then basically, and this is what happens with a lot of indie filmmakers, you put out a film and maybe you start touring, you know, doing the festival circuit. But if you don't really have a plan, then after that, it's just going to be a DVD that's sitting on your shelf yeah. and you know, you and your family and your mom watched it and, and that was it. But if you have a hey, plan, I'm a star of a lot of those movies, man, <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm a star of a lot of those sit at the home DVDs, but <laughs> I'm like the lead actor in all of them sitting on DVD. <laughs> If you if you have that plan from the beginning though, like today, and especially and one other thing, I mean, and you're not a shooter, right? You're an actor, but like if you were to produce, which you you could, oh, if you're yeah. gonna produce your own own film, then look at Amazon, see what what's the criteria to be able to put you know this film or get this film shown on Amazon Prime or Hulu or Netflix, right? Yeah. Let's shoot with the proper camera. So that when we bring it to them, like we know we've we've already checked off those boxes. So I think that's that's really what it is, man. And part of the thing that I do in the book is also trying to help people understand how to contact film critics. 
because again going back to that buzz like you need the critics because the critics like if i go tell people right now go see this film they trust me because they know me and so by being able to tap into those critics in those different circles and kind of getting on like their clout if you will <laughs> then you're able to also reach other markets because that's the thing is like once you once you've shown it to your friends and family, you got to break through to other circles. So yeah. hopefully that answers your question. It takes work and it takes a plan. But like, I'm man, dude, I got friends that they have worked their film in such a way where, I mean, it might not be a whole lot, but I think he had said something like he gets about 1,200 every six months off of the film that he made that was like in 2014. That's still I mean, that stuff adds That's up, good. you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's like groceries for, you know, That's the month, like the six months or whatever, so. Yeah, but, but the point is, that's that's a film from 2014. What about yeah. the film from 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018? Right. Like your, your body of work continues to, to produce for you. And that, I feel like that's an, an amazing thing because that's uh that becomes that makes your catalog valuable. Mm. And so mm. that's that's incredible. Hey, Kim Trail listeners, if you out there and you're making a positive impact in your community, well, we would love to showcase your work. Just email us at kimtrailspodcast at gmail.com. question about one how do you like what accent what exactly is a film festival like i know we talk about it everybody kind of has this notion of what they think it is but a lot of people really don't get past the whole it's a red carpet and people come and take <laughs> pictures of actors and that's that's what it is what what is a what what really is a film festival and what is the what is the 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 true purpose of it and what kind of opportunities does that provide for both young filmmakers and actors yeah that's a man that's a great question dre you about to get me in my film nerd <laughs> <laughs> go ahead take us there man take us there so when you say what is a film festival to me a film festival is a celebration of film now depending on the festival there's different niche festivals like i said dc black film festival so you know that you're going to go in and you're going to see films that are by and or about black people or people of african descent i should say but then you have like the dc asian pacific film festival or there's the la i think it's latino film festival so you can have your niche festivals then you got like sundance which is one of the big meccas but I think people should experience film festivals in their city because what you get most of the time are just stories that you would never see on the big screen or stories that filmmakers have really, I want to say, put their heart and soul into. And I know it sounds really, really cliche, but dude, like on the film festival circuit, you just get, you can tell that like, yo, this artist was passionate about what they did and they really wanted to communicate something to the world. And that's what brings me a lot of pleasure as a festival director, as a programmer, is I see all these different stories that come through 
And man, like filmmakers, they they definitely are a mirror to the world. And by that I mean like, so I'm gonna take my film festival for example. When we first started in 2017, police brutality was really kind of big back then because you know we had Trayvon Martin, we had so many different you know shootings of unarmed black men, and so the 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 films that came in were dealing with that, and. For me, what I say about, especially with my film festival, is that every year I learn something about myself as a Black man and for our culture and our community because these filmmakers are really trying to speak to something, whether it's something that bothers them or whether it's uh, love, relationships, whatever the case may be, like, this is where you get that, like straight from the heart, straight from the soul, because a lot of these filmmakers, they're still working their nine to five, right? So yeah, they're a filmmaker this weekend at the film festival, but then to pay the bills, like they're working someplace else, right? And so for them, if they're going to go out there and they're going to take this experiment, you know, or take this chance on their passion, they're not going to put like some, you know, Adam Sandler, um. 46 and acting like I'm 13, you know, type movie. Yeah. They're they're really trying to come with something from the soul. So, man, dude, I, I know I, I keep answering y'all's question with these like long winded no, things. No, it's okay. <laughs> but but honestly, like film festivals to me is just where great storytelling happens. And honestly, when it comes to the Oscars, dude, like, yes, Black Panther made it where it was possible for you to see a Marvel film get nominated for an Oscar. But otherwise, the films that you see that are nominated for Academy Award were on the film festival circuit before they got there. They generally aren't released in theaters, at least (laughs) pre-COVID, because now that whole game has changed. They were on the film festival circuit before they you know, came in front of the public. Um, AP, you got a question? Yeah, man. Yeah, man, this is a, this is a great episode. I'm learning a lot about the film industry. I know, oh, he kind of talked about it from an actor's aspect, but, you know, seeing it from a director's aspect is, is pretty dope. But my question uh, is about diversity. I know you talked about that a little bit earlier. And it's funny that you mentioned diversity because at my company, they like pushing it heavy. It's like heavy, you know, the inclusion. They we even hired this uh, African American woman as now she's the head of diversity and inclusion or whatever. But so my my question is, is that uh, do you feel like because of George Floyd, do you feel like diversity is something that they just oversaturating like the, you know, just oversaturating in general, and and if that's the case. Is it really diverse in you like the the uh, movie scene, the movie scenes, or you know, are they just because of George Floyd? You know, but they just talking about we promote diversity by doing these commercials, but yeah, we still, hey, we still a good old boy system, and hey, you know, you come on in and all, you sit back over there, you just gonna have to wait. Um, just for clarity, are you talking about within? You're talking about within film and within the film industry. Correct. Okay. I think in some ways, like, we have to see what happens, right? Like, not enough time. Like, May was this year. Not enough time has played out for us to see if there's real change, right? So the Academy has put in place, like, a lot of diversity so that we see a lot more younger folks, diverse folks that are going to be able to have a voice and have a vote. But we have to see if this all has legs, I think, across the board for all industries. And one of the groups that I'm a part of in terms of think tank, one of the things that we talk about is diversity, equality, inclusion, and belonging. Belonging is the part that I think folks don't get. So it's one thing to be like, like to have diverse and to have somebody that's on the team, right? Oh, we got diversity. Oh, trying to bring that equality where AP, your word is, is just as 
has just as much weight as the next person, right? Inclusion in terms of, hey, are all minorities uh, included and, you know, brought in on the team? But belonging, that's, that's where we got a long way to go. Right. When I'm talking with you guys right now, I am myself. I'm chilling. I belong. Right. I feel good around you guys. We talk about Texas Toast just a while ago. Man, y'all brought, <laughs> you brought back some memories. I'm like, yeah, I remember the Texas Toast. Like my dad used to always cook. So, so like there's a certain amount where you just feel comfortable and free to be yourself. And I think that in the industry, regardless, it's hard for people to feel like they belong and are free to be themselves. So I think it's going to still take time. I think that, unfortunately, George Floyd lost his life. But, man, I don't know about y'all, but I know for a fact that, like, all this anger that I had inside of me that I knew was there, but I just, you just... Is I think as a black man, like you just gotta shut that stuff down and you just gotta live life right because like you just can't do, you feel like you can't do nothing about it. And then this happened, and that was when we were like, "Yo, I'm sick of it." I just remember that was the first post that I put. I was just like, "I'm tired of seeing black bodies." You know what I mean? Like, yeah, done like this. And so it's it's just been a moment in time and in history that I think really got the attention, obviously, of the world. But we got we to gotta let it play out a little bit more just to see where things go and if, if this is really going to hold. I think, I think I, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I think that things are going to change. But I still think that it just takes a long time. Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, real quick before we get into the landing, uh, I feel like I have to ask this. Going back to an O N uh, A P question, you know, when you're trying to get those sponsorship and and money f- to make these films, how do you avoid? Because this also go dealing with integrity. How do you avoid certain what's that word I'm looking for? Agendas, political agendas, or any type of agenda where it's like, hey, I want your money, but I don't want your agenda. So how do you network amongst that ideal or whatever when when pitching these movies? Yeah, that's a really good question. So for some reason, I feel like I got to say I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> but I mean, I think at the end of the day, man, again, I think it goes back to integrity and it goes back to your conscious. And you know if like what you're willing to bend on and what you're not. And sometimes it just means passing up the money so that right. you can, like I said, you can sleep at night. And the thing about it, man, is that what I realize is a lot of times when we make those tough decisions and, and you do the right thing, like, it'll work out in the end, right? So you might have passed up a bag, but you either A, you get to keep your vision, and when you put it out there, Like, it just resonates with the people. Mm -hmm. Then everybody's like, ah, man, this is so awesome, blah, blah, blah. And so maybe you get it on the back end. Maybe you don't. Again, that goes back to sleeping at night. But what I typically find is that if you just wait around, like, the right people will find you. And so, again, going back to building that tribe, if you build that tribe, like, people will be like, yo, check out this movie. I saw this. You should get behind it. You know what I mean? And so I think it's all about, a lot of times it becomes about who you know. And like they say, like, you know, practice meeting preparation and, and the right moment, man, things can really take off. Um, so outside of the DC Black Film Festival, how many other film festivals do you kind of associate with or network with and and kind of you know i guess yeah just basically network with in terms of like creating this system and because you mentioned a circuit right so what is this circuit and and how many other film festivals are like yours or have a, a similar intention to yours where young artists can be promoted yeah that's a great question so like because my 
film festivals in the DC area. I network a lot with different DC area film festivals. So like I said, DC APA, which is the Asian Pacific American Film Festival, DC Web Fest, uh, Tessa Godard runs that, um, DC Shorts. Um, we collaborated this past year on, we, ha- we had a collaborative seminar, if you will, on the power of the short. And so we just talked about why, you know, shorts are powerful. So we had some folks that represented DC Shorts, folks that had came through DC Black Film Festival and collaborate that way. As I said, I was, I'm on the board of the Film Festival Alliance. And so there's a whole bunch of film festivals that are around the country and we all talk. And then also, you know, this is globally as well. So for specifically more so my niche, one of the cool, and this is kind of how I know like our programming is on point is, you know, you have Black Star Film Festival, uh, or they call themselves Black Star, but their festival is uh, in Philly and they're doing amazing work and amazing things there. There's the uh, Martha's Vineyard African American Film Festival. They're doing amazing things. And so when you talk about the circuit, what generally happens is like Black Star will have theirs one week in August, then uh, Martha's Vineyard, then we do. And so a lot of times you can see the filmmakers, if you follow their social media, oh, we're at Black Star, now we're at uh, Martha's Vineyard, now we're at DC Black Film Festival. And so that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about like the circuit. They're making those rounds to different film festivals and you see which fest- which uh, films are like really kind of doing well that year and have gotten picked up by a numerous amount of, of film festivals. But yeah, like I love networking and talking with other film festivals because honestly, like that's how I, I'm able to make my film festival better. There, there comes a point when for DCBFF, like it starts to, be, it starts to become more of a public safety <laughs> festival, right? So if you imagine like Sundance as big as it is, like, that is no longer just, like, you know, some people are coming in and watching one screen for the week week uh, or weekend or whatever, but it becomes, like, this thing that allows that whole city to eat in terms mm-hmm. of people to send, and they're spending money at restaurants. Um, they need a place to sleep. Airbnb is off the chain. You got folks that are driving buses to drop people off to different places. So it becomes a whole industry where yeah, it's an economic engine in of in and of itself. Right. Exactly. So so it's important for me as a smaller fest to learn from bigger fests so that I can know how to grow. And and then at the same time, like with the Film Festival Alliance, we're trying to come up with um, what are some industry standards that we want to have for filmmakers, for patrons, etc. So that's kind of how that works. You have all right. Austin, Go Texas, ahead. brother. <laughs> <laughs> Word. You started out yeah. here, man. You know Austin Big Film for Texas, at least. So you know. I feel yeah, like y'all y'all have, have. I feel like y'all have a film festival. Um, I'll probably have to look it up. This we do. One, okay. I don't know about a black one though. I'll have to check. I haven't. You know, I kind of just moved here, so I, I don't know about that one. Yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what is that? South by Southwest? South by Southwest is the big one. Yeah, you know, that's the big one. Yeah. Houston has a black film festival, too. Yeah, that's what I was just about to say. Houston has one. Whatever, so. Yeah. Well, we hate to do this, but we have to move on to the landing. We're going to take a quick break right quick, and we'll be back. Y'all cool, boy. I got um, got some Evan Williams over here, so I'm, I'm just chilling. Oh, okay. See, I'm being all modest. Okay, so I went and got some wine because we cooked spaghetti tonight, and uh, I got a little Marlo, so I was like, hey, once I start <laughs> drinking one type of thing, I just keep drinking that all night. Boy, I got that spaghetti on Marlo. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was Sunday. That, that sauce with the red wine, I 
brother. Yeah, it was the wife. It was Sunday. The wife was like, can you pick up a bottle of wine? I said, okay. <laughs> a little Texas toast garlic bread, too. Yeah, yeah, you know, and what I do, I take the Texas toast, right? I put the little meat sauce on top of the Texas toast, man. That's what I do. Right, you gotta soak it up, soak it up. Yeah, you gotta soak it up. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, to catch exclusive content from this episode or any of our previous episodes, subscribe to our Patreon at Kim Trails Podcast. All right, guys, man, we hate to do this, but yes, it's the landing. And I'm going to go ahead and, and say that I want to thank Kevin Sampson for coming on the Kim Trails podcast today. I'm I'm a film advocate. Uh, I love movies. I remember at, in college in my prayer view days when I was had a little moment of studying film. My mainly studies was the TCM channel, Turner Classic Movies. But even with that, I learned a lot in it and I grew my own appreciation for film. And just to have you on this show today to enlighten me and open my eyes to certain things. And and I can't wait. And in 2021, when you do your film festival, man, man, I love uh, all three of us, or four of us, real. I mean, I'll fly to DC. And we'll come and we'll participate, man. And just to be in the atmosphere, man. I, like I said, man. I thank you for coming on this show, man. And and uh, hopefully we'll have you back, man, in the future. Yeah, man. I appreciate you guys having me on. I definitely would love to come back on. This was a great conversation. And let's let's hope that in 2021, y'all will be able to come to DC because. Co- like I like I said, COVID has just changed the industry. And I, I I mean, there's nothing beats being in a theater with people. And I say this a lot, but when yeah. the lights go down, doesn't matter what color you are, all of a sudden we're just humans having an experience. And mm. that collective energy, when we all laugh, because it's funny when we see someone that dies on the screen and we all Suddenly it gets a little dusty in the theater. Right. It's the human experience. So, yeah, man. I definitely, definitely hope that you guys can make it. Where, where can our uh, listeners find out more about you and more about your festival and more importantly uh, as well, your book? Because I feel like that just sounds like a gem for all those actors, all those future filmmakers out there, all those indie artists that are looking for that blueprint. Man, yeah, tell them where to find it. Yeah, I appreciate the question. So I am kevinsampson.com. We'll take you to all the different websites and give you a little information on me as well as where you can buy the book. Again, the book Army of One, PR and Marketing for the Indie Filmmaker. I also have another book, How to Be a Movie Critic. So if anybody wants to learn how to be a movie critic, I, I talked with 16 of my colleagues, and uh, just kind of put that out there. But you can also go to picturelockshow.com to read movie reviews and dcbff.org for the DC Black Film Festival. Find out how you can submit. And definitely, uh, I hope that the listeners that are listening, you know, just reach out because we need we need your stories. We We need those personal stories. One of the things I find is that the more personal your story is, the more universal it is. Like the more that if this is like a true to, I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, but a Columbia, South Carolina story, it's an Austin, Texas story, right? It just might look a little different, but you can feel that vibe. So. Um, oh, any last words? Uh, man, I'm just grateful to hear hear from you, brother, especially being a young black man, being an entrepreneur and an author at that too, brother. I plan on getting those books, my man. So it's been <laughs> a blessing to be in your presence. Trust me, I will be having a film circulating in your film festival, my brother. You're going to be the first person I hit up once the film is done, my man. So that's what I, it is. Just want to thank Kim Trails too. Thank you guys for always having me on too with them, you know, to learn this knowledge. That's what's up, man. I, I already hit up your IMDb, so I'm gonna try to see if I can sc- see some of these uh, 
these black busters that you were in. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Hey, DVD show. I laugh because, you know, it's humble beginning. So, you know, it's all good with me, man. <laughs> but that, that's it, man. Not a lot of people have as many um, accolades as you even have, like, listed. Yeah. So props to you, man. You, you, you're you doing the work. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. I just appreciate you for coming on, man, for, you know, dropping knowledge on the game, bringing us insight and just, uh, you know, being a role model, man. Like I said, O is my, my basically like my brother, man. So seeing him come up through the acting scene and stuff like that, I started to take, you know, movies more seriously and or they hold, they resonate with me a little bit differently now, especially like Birth of a Nation, you know, with the Nat Turner story. That really, it really did hit me like a different way. And I felt a different way after I watched that. And I had to reflect on it for a little bit before I could like actually, you know, get back to normal. So yeah, man, bro, we definitely bring you back on, man. Like I said, I, I like the vibes. I like your energy. I like what you're doing for the community. You know what I'm saying? You're also a teacher too. I always have big respect for people that's teaching, you know, especially to the youth because they are the future. So I feel like you're investing in the future and that's a big deal. So yeah, brother, I appreciate you, Kevin. Like I said, you will be back on, man. Man, I appreciate it. And I appreciate you guys because, you know, as uh, Chris was breaking down, you know, what Chemtrail stand for for me um, and just spreading knowledge, I, I think it's so important. And so I really um, the respect is mutual. And I, and I appreciate, again, it's just a place where we can just kind of talk and just be ourselves but at the same time, learn and grow from one another. So I appreciate you guys, and I appreciate you having me on. All right, man. And that's it, guys. Man, we'd like to thank Kevin for coming on again. Um, for Catch us at Chemtrails Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, send us an email at chemtrailspodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget to write, rate, and review and share this podcast. And, um... Until next time, we out. Hey, Kim Chua listeners. Want to leave a message? Just click the link in our show notes to leave a voicemail. And if you come from a simpler times like myself, just call. Leave us a voice message at 832-308-0529. And don't forget, all messages can record up to three minutes long. What up, what up? It's your boy AP. Make sure you follow us at Chemtrails Podcast. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, hit us up. Once again, that's Kim Trails Podcast at Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Peace out. Get your voice heard at www.chemtrails.mn.co. Join the community. She wouldn't be blackballed. I think it would be more accepted now. Oh, uh, yeah. Was, now it would. Yeah. After everything Y'all wanna we through. re up or anything? You can... <laughs> I want to <see> <laughs> Did he take this opportunity to go ahead and pull up? He was like, Y'all want to re up? I am. <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, man, nah, but that that's a great point. Oh, you mind if I call you? Oh, everybody else yeah, is. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah.